Very good. So welcome, everyone. Um, today, we'd like to welcome you to participate in a panel. It's not just us talking to you. We'd like to hear from you. Um, we'd like to have you participate in a panel which is talking about the experiences of carrier service providers in working with OpenStack, first experiences, second experiences, lessons learned. Um, and then we'll head into what are the types of things we want to see uh, from OpenStack and what are the types of things we want to do with OpenStack uh, and sort of explore uh, the futures as we move through. We have 40 minutes, so we'll, we'll keep it pretty brief. Um, do feel free, if you want to extend a question or if you want to challenge an answer, um, to jump up and do so. So my name's Christopher Price. I work at Ericsson. Uh, I'm, I'm a board member for OpenStack and OPNFV. Uh, and I will be trying to give these guys a hard time during the day. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves now, uh, starting with, with Adam. Hi, Adam Dunson. I manage uh, SDN and NFV Engineering. So um, kind of rare. I'm a development manager, not a labs architecture -y kind of guy. Uh, Naranjan Abdullah. I'm a fellow at Verizon Network Planning, and I'm in the network team that designs the architecture for our cloud platform and the evolution planning for the Verizon Wireless Network. My name is Greg Stigler. I'm from AT&T. Uh, for the last three years, I've been in charge of our cloud, our OpenStack cloud, AT&T integrated cloud. In the last few months, I've picked up additional responsibility for our domain 2.0 virtual network function platform, where I have integrated testing and I also have integrated design for the whole entire platform. Very good. Thanks, gents. Um, so just to briefly introduce, introduce the topics, we get Ford's, uh, we talk about telcos as being special, and then we tell them they're not special, and, and it's kind of confusing to understand what is the telecommunications requirement, why is it a challenge, and how does it differ from someone else trying to run a data center. Um, I think if you take it from a telecommunications perspective, they have a lot of infrastructure, they have a lot of new capabilities they need to bring in, and old physical infrastructure and capabilities they need to replace. Uh, they have supported by networking challenges, which then need to fit into an OpenStack-based cloud architecture. Uh, on top of that, they have existing operation systems. They have new operation systems. Um, and all of this has to fit together in some way to deploy the services that we, uh, as consumers of these um, services, rely on and enjoy using. So from the perspective of trying to fit OpenStack into what is already a very complicated architecture and, and, and well, physical and services architecture, um, I'd like to sort of get into the questions around OpenStack. Um, so the first question, I guess, to the panelists um, is, when did you start working with OpenStack? When did you take it into production? Um, what were the challenges and the main hurdles that you had to overcome um, as you took those first steps and first brave steps to bring things, things live with OpenStack? Taking volunteers. Well, I can get started. Uh, so we had a small group in Verizon. We started looking at OpenStack back in 2013 timeframe. It was around the Havana release. That was the first, one of the first releases we started looking at. And we had a very specific objective in mind. We had a specific use case around packet core that we were looking to virtualize. And we were looking at what are the deficiencies uh, in the current feature set and what do we need to do to get, get it deployed. And one of the first things we Stumbles we ran into was around IPv6 because we wanted to build a cloud not on, that not only supports network elements that you know that run on IPv6, we wanted to build the infrastructure itself on IPv6. That was one of the first feature change uh, that we wanted to get implemented in OpenStack, and we honestly were quite pleased. You know, it was one of the first uh, good things uh, that came out of OpenStack. We got IPv6, and we have our Verizon Cloud Platform deployed on IPv6 uh, today. Yeah. Many, many moons ago, <laughs> we were a founding partner, I think, on the foundation. Well, so we got started back with Diablo. And uh, we, we talked the other day at, uh, at, at, at our prep session about I didn't know what was before Diablo. And I think we figured that out. What was the C? Cactus. Cactus, <laughs> yes. We didn't, I didn't know that. So, but, but there were people before my time that were doing Diablo, because that was greater than three years ago. So. They, they learned a lot from those early implementations that we were able to take into our later implementations. Today, uh, we're running anywhere from Kilo uh, to Mataka. 
Yeah, so we, we, I've only been with the company nine months. And in fact, I've only been at, I only have nine months of experience as a carrier. Up until nine months ago, I was a vendor, so for 20 years. So I'm kind of a different guy here. But our journey at CenturyLink to virtualization started quite a long time before me. We actually have a big complex of VMware uh, running virtualization, as well as a number of complexes running, uh, quite a number of complexes running, uh, running OpenStack. And uh, we're on our third kind of major release with a lot of minor releases in between that, that we're rolling out uh, kind of right now. Um, so that complex that we, that we, the first kind of major OpenStack system we put into production was, uh, you know, was last year. But we started this journey in 2011. I can looking over at someone who's trying to nod 11. We started the journey in 2011. <laughs> yeah, my Renner crowd's here, so. <laughs> All right, so following on from that, and then nine months in, have you had to upgrade any sites? Sure. And <laughs> tell us about it. Look, I mean, the, I mean the, uh, you know, we talk a lot about turning things upside down. Um, as you talked about carriers and complexity, you know, we kind of revel in complexity. Everything is so complex. We start these programs and we try to ca carry all these features into these programs. We ask all these different people to get all this consensus around building this thing, if you can actually get enough consensus to get a program started, by the time you've got it started, it is so big and complicated that you know, you're likely to getting this thing into production is really, really hard. What I've, what I've learned is you know, there's, a lot about the, there's a lot more challenge in process than there is in engineering inside, inside large scale carriers. Um, so our experience in upgrading, little things are easy. You know, we, little things are easy. Our tooling isn't where we want it to be. You know, we want it to be really automated. Um, as we go through our ne into our next release, we're really simplifying our OpenStack complex. I mean, we are taking, it is bare bones as to what's in this thing. And the purpose behind that is really to make it easy for us to go and get this into production. And it's not just the engineering and build and design and automation and tools, it's how we get it through the whole complex of people. How do we improve the processes so our people can you know, take this into production at scale rapidly? How do we march it all the way through such that we can easily integrate it with all of our parts. And at the core of it's you know, kind of simplicity. So I think we're doing it now. Um, our next upgrade's not gonna be that easy because we're jumping, a bunch of, we're jumping a bunch of releases. We're gonna go to Newton. Mm -hmm. And we're jumping a bunch of releases. Got a whole different set of packages inside the thing. We're actually stripping a ton of stuff out. And so it's not gonna be easy. I'm looking at the guy in the room who does this. And it's not gonna be easy yet, but you know, I think, uh, Tooling's the answer to this. Very good. Greg, from Diablo onwards, I guess you've had similar challenges. Yes, and I'll, I'll play off of deployment and production too because it, it was absolutely one of the most challenging things we had. So um, I know the slide before mentioned the mega data center or something close to that, but we're deploying many clouds in, in central offices that are close to our customers for latency reasons. I think we're, we're, all, both, we're all doing we're that both, up yeah. here. Yeah. That's nothing uh, unique. Um, so that to be able to deploy that many clouds that quick, uh, the mechanisms weren't there. So we had to work very hard to develop those and uh, had worked back with the community on those. The interesting thing is containers is taking over at a time uh, when the mechanization we did before is really going to become outdated and we're going to move to the container containerized control plane as well. So pretty interesting. Very cool. Yeah, yeah the models, you know, quite different, right? I mean, if you're doing a compute kind of thingy, you set up a bunch of controllers and maybe have a handful of these things spread across the place. But we do an NFV and we have a, we have different teams to different things. We're not doing a unified cloud. We have a compute and service cloud for the kind of normal compute orientated stuff. And then we have our cloud that we work on, our bit that we work on is an NFV system. It's designed to run VNFs to forward packets and it's optimized around packet processing performance. And so it's a different puzzle. And in the same way, there's a controller in every, at every, every rack of stuff or every location, it's a controller and there's a controller and it's a, a single entity running. So the tooling that we have to put together means that as we go and roll out sites, we're not just adding compute nodes everywhere we go, we're building systems every time we do it. And so I'm sure you've had to do tooling and we have had to do it too because that's not the, the deployment mode that's more common in a generalized compute storage and networking mode when we're very network heavy. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only difference 
from what we're doing is we want unified code for the cloud. So we may deploy different, Amazon would call them instance types, uh, yeah. you know, for, for compute power, whether it's GPU or memory intensive or uh, CPU intensive. So we really see the advantage being to have single set of orchestration, single set of APIs that manage both of those platforms. And the, the only difference is the flavor series, which Toby Ford you know, was, it was our OpenStack Foundation member, and he coined that name. I don't know if it's taken off or not. I kind of like instance types myself, but uh, <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yeah, we, we were very similar in the sense that the difference is that um, we have a common hardware. Right, so so we're, we're all trying to get to the same place. We, we're probably following a different goat path than you because they're all goat paths in this stuff, right? So, right. so, so we have common hardware and we have common, we have common hardware control across the complexes and so we're building common hardware. So someone who wants to run something that you know, is, uh, we traditionally run an appliance for, we don't have to do all the extra work. If we just want to control hardware, you know, there's a lot of aspects to doing this. Let me step back a little bit. So one of the aspects of this is just common procurement, right? I mean, you've got to go and, you go and do this to save money, and common procurement of servers is really helpful. There's all these different ways that you build up a business plan to actually do this kind of stuff. But if you go and say, hey, I want to run some particular very fixed function thing that used to run in an appliance, and you've got to run all these steps through OpenStack, and it's never, we're never going to run too many of them up and down. They're never going to go up and down. They're never really going to scale. We bind them, plug them in. We go, well, we can get to that later, but let's build a hardware structure. So we have a common hardware structure. So our, 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 our uh, kind of management sales, you guys, will talk about we have one big cloud. And we kind of do it's all on the same hardware. But it has instances inside it, and they're not necessarily as uniform. In our effort to try and you know, build the right thing for the right job. And I think that a cloud, a common cloud can be built. And I think we could do it. I think it's just a whole lot more work. So it, down our path towards simplicity and getting velocity, we've said, let's build an NFV one and head down that path from a velocity course, perspective. Just one short comment. For sure, yeah. this strategy has not been an easy one yeah. because culturally it's difficult for different departments to get It's true with, too. It makes, right? That would make it even harder. The merge of network and IT. So culturally to get them to think along the same lines of the same set of code but different instance types has not been an easy thing. But yeah. I think we're, we're reaching a, a level of understanding across the I'm glad I haven't had to try and fight that battle. Yeah. I've had skirmishes with those guys already, yes. but yeah. I haven't had to go that uh, far. I've got, I have, I <laughs> have, have scars. Yeah. 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 yeah, they have a very different view of what we should do, right? So. <laughs> So, but to, to get to your point about upgrade, I think upgrade is largely an unsolved problem. Uh, you know, we have, like Greg said, we got many clouds. We have kilos, instances, we have Newton instances, and trying to figure out how we get from kilo to Newton. It's complicated by the fact that the infrastructure itself needs to be taken offline to be upgraded. And the applications that run on this infrastructure, they're, for the most part, not cloud-native applications today. These are network functions. I mean, we were running up, you know, these network appliances, effectively appliances, purpose-built hardware, and largely what we have today is, you know, vendors have put in the software to run within virtual form factors, but still it's the same software. It comes with this, you know, it doesn't support elasticity. You can't take it offline. State is tightly coupled. So taking sites offline, doing an upgrade, that's, that's a challenge. And I think there's a combination of factors that need to, you know, that will help this. One is, to Greg's point, OpenStack is becoming containerized, so you can leverage these new technologies uh, to help with the, on, you know, uh, rolling updates with OpenStack, and applications start to move to become decomposed into microservices, decoupled state, so the applications themselves become more cloud native. I think that's the evolution that needs to happen for this to be truly seamless. Yeah. So on that topic then, looking, looking forwards, um, we'll have purchasing practices, we, we strive for common hardware. It's not always possible, especially as you approach an edge. Um, we talk about the need to be able to manage applications as we go through upgrades on sites. Um, and, and hitless upgrade is, is one of those telco things that we have always kind of had. There are different ways to skin the cat in a virtual world. How do you see this as we move forwards? Are you able to take advantage of um, mobility? Which, which technologies do you find for application mobility would be the most useful in the context of how you're building your clouds and, and how that runs out infrastructure as a service layer? 
Well, live migration is not the right answer. <laughs> Let me start off with that. <laughs> I think application mobility really means applications need to be able to tolerate failures. You must assume that things will fail because they are going to fail. So you must be able to take, you know, duplicate state locally in a geodendent fashion. And you know, when you look at state, you have to kind of look at one size fits all. You have to apply the cap theorem. You know, what are we talking about? What application is this? What state is this? And what kind of consistency and availability do we need? So decouple the application you know, to, into call processing functions, state management functions, and a unified front end, and be able to you know, uh, leverage that. Uh, and I think that's part of getting to the cloud native, uh, you know, uh, to the end target of being cloud native. This is a great topic to what we were just talking about before, the difference between the cloud guys and the network guys, right? So it's a, it's a great topic, and this comes up when we talk yeah. about this type of conversation. So, so one, of the, uh, one of the things that we certainly have in our network, and I assume it's in other places as well, is there's been a proliferation of BGP, right? So BGP's everywhere. And so, so we, we're in the, engaged in an upgrade right now, and we've got sites all over the place. And so, you know, you can imagine that there's one in Arlington and another one in, in Baltimore, right? And, and from an upgrade perspective, if we need to upgrade that complex, all we need to do is figure out how to move the VMs between those two places, right? Because in reality, they don't really have to be in the same place. Now, they're different complexes, and they're managed by different controls, but they don't have to be in the same place. But for us, in most of the use cases, because they're networking use cases hooked up to our BGP infrastructure, you can seamlessly move this over by just figuring out where to put it next. So the way we did this is, of course, the solver is incomplete in the you know, OpenStack's layout is not going to help us with this problem. So we write a solver to go and do this. And if you add a basic layout system to versions plus latency, you can go and say, hey, can I pick up that firewall and move it up the street to Arlington, put it, put it into the BGP topology, you know, fail the other guy, it'll reroute, everything's hunky-dory, and then go and re solve my problem. So I think we think about this problem of, as networking guys a little bit, more than perhaps more than perhaps our IT, our, our IT and, 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 uh, and cloud partners do, because I think we, you know, we think, maybe we do, maybe we don't, we have a better understanding of the network and our ability to use capabilities in the network. So I don't think it's solely a, how do I make OpenStack do this? I think there are other ways to get this done, and we've got to be a bit scrappy to make it work, because at the end of the day, you can't get in to work if you're not scrappy about it. We need help from the VNF vendors, first and foremost. I mean, the, most of the VNFs that are being delivered to our table today are not cloud native. Yep. Uh, that's got to change. And, and we've updated our VNF guidelines. Uh, they're out on our website, so go grab them. But uh, we, we've got to have VNFs that are actually microservices that we can scale. Um, that's where the industry is. That's where the web scale industry went. Yeah and the network service industry is behind that. So we need help in writing these things the right way. I would also say we could do a better job with OpenStack internally when it comes to microservices and containers as well. Yeah, amen to that, I agree. I think network functions are largely direct ported you know, applications today. And we're gonna need, you know, need to break it up into microservices, decompose them, separate state from transaction processing, and that's key to elasticity, to getting you know, rolling updates going and so on, you know, uh, feature velocity, et cetera. Very good, so before, before we sort of pivot, I wanted to move to futures, um, or even as we pivot to futures, I did want to open for the audience to get involved here and ask these guys questions. We've heard what I think is three very similar but slightly different approaches to, to how to address uh, a number of the challenges we have. Um, if anyone has any questions, the mics are here, and, and I'm more than happy to, to have you guys get involved and start to give these guys a hard time. I think that would be ideal. Um, but if no one's standing up, then I would like to ask... Ah, there we go. Nah. So uh, thank you and, for the discussion. And I, please introduce yourself. Well, my name please. is Andre Steller. I'm Director of Service Provider Architecture for Infoblox. We're a, we're a vendor, DNS, DHCP, IP address management. So. Um, from, uh, so question and comment. So what I'm hearing is I hear, you know, definitely different viewpoints. And I hear AT&T, you know, obviously you know, doing a good job in leadership here in, in OpenStack, uh, contributions broadly across all the different working groups. Um, but, you know, built a custom proprietary front end, which is, is needed to interface with their infrastructure. 
So there's a, this drive for standardization that isn't necessarily being pushed to the rest of the world. And then I hear CenturyLink talking about, you know, they've been, done a lot of acquisitions, so, so I would think that standardization would have definitely benefited them from a business standpoint if, if we had adopted this, you know, broadly or more broadly. And then um, I, I hear Verizon talking about how, you know, they're, they're very focused on real operational problems and, and how to solve those operational problems. So, so appreciate the, the candor and the comments. But I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is that doesn't it make sense that we have a, a, a really embracing the standards approach? Isn't that the way that we can help leverage this moving faster? And then, and, and when we look at microservices and containers as, as the next evolution, how long will we continue to support the existing infrastructure in our current, you know, NFV, BNF-based solutions? Because I see that as being, you know, a four or five year effort at least uh, as we get containers ready to go into a service provider environment. So so I'd can like can, to I, can, can on I do one thing first? You'll like this. You'll love this. <laughs> I, need, I need a button. So, <laughs> so, so I'm thrilled to be here, right? I'm thrilled to be here because most of the people in this room write code, I hope. But since we're the carrier audience, that's probably not the case, right? But most of the people in a lot of these other rooms write code. I want to draw a, a parallel for a second here. NFV and, Kube and containerism, Containerism, is that a word? Well, yeah. It doesn't matter. It so containerism matter. <laughs> started at about the same time. How far has containerization got versus how far NFV has got? NFV's nowhere. Containering, the whole container infrastructure has gone along at a rapid pace. Yep. Why is that? They didn't bother with standardization. They didn't go to Babelfests where they talk about writing documents. They didn't do it, right? And so so you're right, things have to work together. But, and, and there is a, this lack of comfort around you know, not having standards inside the carrier world, and there's a balance to getting it right, but I think we're responsible for our own destiny here, right? We are responsible for our own destiny, and so we need to take responsibility for that destiny. If that results in things where we collaborate together, that's great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We get economies of scale, and we all want economies of scale. But I'm not a supporter of this, let's go to standards. Yeah. So what, what AT&T front end were you referring to that? Ecom. Ecom? Ecom has been outsourced as ONAP, fully outsourced now. So it's out there for, we'd like you, you to join the community, in fact. I'm done. And you know, write a check and be part of it. So uh, <laughs> we would That's love that. But, but we have fully open sourced that. It's been combined with Triple O, and I think we have Open O. Open O. Open -O. Open -O. Oop, wrong one. Open O. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Somehow Triple O is still in this mess, though. But. Already thirty. I think thirty-four percent is the number. I'm going to get in trouble with the media guys, but I think thirty-four percent of the major wireless carriers across the globe have already joined. So it's, it's got a lot of momentum behind it. In fact, I thought you might be talking about ORM, which is OpenStack Resource Manager, which we presented back in Austin. And I think the only reason that one's not in OpenStack because OpenStack hasn't consumed it yet. But we would be happy to give that as well. So we, this, this is open. And I'll tell you, this is kind of back to the future. Telecom companies have always done business together. We have had to have interconnection agreements and ways do. to do business. Yep. This is back to the future, what we're doing here, but I, but I do agree with your point. We have to move and we have to decide and we cannot linger. And I think there's a little lingering going on. That's why we started the ELCU, which is the large contributing OpenStack operators. The large is important because we need people who can scale. Okay, we need to figure out there's scaling problems in OpenStack. We need to fix that. The contributing part is we don't want people who are just gonna take, we want people who are going to give and be part of the process. And of course the operators part is, well, the vendors have led this thing for a long time. And we want to partner with you, we need you. But we also have to get our perspective heard. Um, no, of course, I mean, we, we contribute code back in, they upstream our code to IPAM, pluggable framework. But, yeah. and, and I understand it, it's a, a, your wing, you know, business opportunity, especially like in the CenturyLink example, right? versus you know, trying to move forward quickly. So that was why the second part of my question on, you know, as we move forward, how do you see the, uh, the uh, containerization um, and moving forward in terms of what we're supporting today in an NFV uh, framework? 
I think it's your turn. Yeah, I think yeah you have a guy. You have a guy. I got an opinion, but you I have an opinion. You get the easy part of the question. Well, <laughs> I, I think containers is largely going to be an opinion. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the industry is spoken. I mean, there is there is the Docker world, the Kubernetes, the CNC of world. I think we'll largely, you know, pick around, converge around one of those proper popular communities. But, you know, to your point about standards, I think standards have a role, like 3GPP and IETF, where you talk about protocols and interoperability between network functions, between operators. But this is an implementation, you know, where do we, how do we deploy this? And there, you know, whatever we pick now may not be the best solution for tomorrow, so we're going to need to experiment around it. So. Uh, it largely becomes, you know, what's, what's our platform? Expl explain that platform clearly, lay out a roadmap, and, and, you know, give you the avenues to come and test, and, and I excel in that platform. Yeah. You can solve a lot of problems with a container with Node.js in it. Yes. Very good. Thanks, guys. We had another question? No? Answered? Maybe. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I would like to, I would like to explore... Um, some of the themes that have come up this week. Um, the themes around containerization, uh, containerization of OpenStack, running containers over OpenStack. Um, how are you looking as you look forwards? How are you looking to take advantage of that? I mean, as you said, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of optionality, a lot of ways that this can work. In, in your mind's eye, if, if you look you know, two years down the track, how would you like to see your machinery humming? With the, with the composition of containers and open stack and infrastructure of services and application management? Well, uh, let me give you my view there. Uh, I mean, we have open stack, which is largely built to support virtual machines and you know, virtualized network functions. But uh, like I was saying earlier, you know, our vision has largely been, you know, we got bare metal purpose built appliances today. And we want to get to cloud native, but we can't just take the leap overnight. And we, you know, we need to stepping stone, and virtualization is a stepping stone, which is what we're executing right now. But our vision has always been to get to cloud native architectures, so which also means building an infrastructure that can support cloud native architectures. I mean, what is a cloud native application? Effectively, it's an application that's built around on, on the cloud efficiently. So we have to have the infrastructure that has think, you know, we gotta have a container orchestration engine, be able to specify what's my deployment unit, you know, what, uh, whatever language you pick and whatever declaration language you pick and having, you know, um, a log analysis infrastructure so you could expose your logs to that, you know, having, um, you know, key management functions as part of the infrastructure, networking that is seamless. So uh, we, that's, you know, that's the direction we expect to go uh, in, in that regard. So, uh, containers are extremely important. Um, OpenStack is extremely important. They both go together. There was a great keynote the other two days ago by the Google fellow, I forget the name. Uh, but it, it, he showed the layers, and he showed the application layers Kubernetes doesn't handle. So there's our VNS, right? Then there's Kubernetes that handles the containers, and then there's OpenStack that handles the infrastructure as well. So it's, it's a marriage. It's a perfect marriage, in fact. It's one that goes together very well. There's always going to have to be something that pixie boots hardware, that manages hardware, that, that does the things that you need to do in the data center. And you know what a great thing to have ironic and some of the options you can do to tag everything in your data center and get an automated inventory right away. Uh, so, so I think they coexist together for a long time, but they have to continue to come together. I don't want that to be a long standards process, but what I don't want... I might not see it. What I many. don't want... <laughs> I might not be there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but what I don't want are five different companies developing products and selling them in that space when we can mm. come up with one way to do it that's already pretty much there. Mm. OpenStack Helm, if you're interested. <laughs> so... You want to? No, go ahead. go ahead. So I was going to add one thing, which is I see a little bit of divergence between the OpenStack world with VMs and the container world when it comes to networking. I mean, we need high-performance networking. I mean, we're all network companies. We do run high-performance uh, elements that have high throughput, high packets per second requirements. So what we've done in the OpenStack world was to do things like SRIOE, which give us high-performance networking, but it comes with a set of operational challenges. 
But now we're moving into user space networking, you know, with DPDK, OBS, DPDK, VPP, and all the advances. So networking has gone into user space uh, within OpenStack. But if you look in the container world, what are containers? Fundamentally, they're kernel objects, you know, kernel C groups and kernel namespaces. So everything around containers must be managed in the kernel. When you move networking out of the kernel, well, it doesn't really fit natively within the container architecture. So what I also see going on in the Linux world is kernel networking is making a comeback. There's a lot of new promising technologies, uh, BPF, XTP, and so on, where they're looking at high-performance kernel networking. So I see right now a little bit of divergence in, on the evolution path, and uh, we really need to figure out what is the, the, you know, what we need is a common networking infrastructure, virtual networking infrastructure, that is, that ties in these two domains. And I think that's a little bit of a struggle we have today. Where is, where is this going? You know, we've got to think two different paths. Yeah, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to go again twice. Okay, okay. I'm going to go after you. <laughs> Sorry. So i got something to talk but, about. But that was so good because yeah. The networking piece is, is the weakest piece in OpenStack, and I'm sorry yeah. to Neutron leaders and everybody, but it just but is. We didn't ask them to build it this so, way either, right? No. We're b doing it ourselves a different way, yeah. so, you know, so it's well, okay. we all are now, because yeah. the layer three part's not included, and that's where we have a bunch of five different vendor solutions. It's more like 50, but uh, that's something we've got to solve for. Now, Gluon's one way that's, that's a proposed project to solve it. I don't know if that's the best way, but this is something that's got to get solved for so we can module, mo uh, that's a tough word, so we can plug in modules, <laughs> okay, whenever we want to. We could run multiple SDN components when we want to. We have SDN dash, I think, through the entire alphabet. Uh, of different small microservices for SDN components. So uh, you were right on. That's the, all I wanted to do is jump on the bandwagon. I mean, you know, we'll take on doing some of this stuff ourselves. We have a whole pile of DPDK stuff that we've written, and uh, because that's where we came from, right? As I said, we were in the land of vendors, so we kind of built a bunch of DPDK stuff. So we have a bunch of those people. But I, but I think you know, across the state here are America's three largest carriers. Right, I mean, just to give you a context as what's going on here, and and we're doing similar things. But I think if we were to, if we were allowed to, and which we're obviously not, to drill into the details. Once we drilled into the details of what we do, they're all different enough to be different, right? I mean, so so as we drill down in this path, and so there's a couple of things we're thinking about. The first thing is, you know, how different are we really, right? And so when we interact, and it's a new experience for me being on this side. When we interact with vendors, here we get into the vendor bit, don't cry. Oh, he's, yeah, afraid yeah. He's, gonna, he's gonna cry when yeah. I talk about vendors, right? So when we get into this vendor thing, you have gotta realize that what you're doing when you pitch to us is you're talking about all the differences between your product and another one. And so I was recently in a thing where we were talking about big data systems, you know, whose databases we're gonna buy. And they said, Adam, you must have an opinion. And I said, I don't care. They said, you must have an opinion, Adam. You got an opinion on everything. I said, I don't care. They said, why don't you care? I said, look, we're going to buy a big data system here. We're going to make some decisions. We're trying to rationalize the number of databases that we've got. And you know, in the big scheme of things, the vendor solutions, they're talking about the 10% margin that makes them different. But we probably only use 40% of all the features anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it's very likely that they're all exactly the same. So we keep arguing because our vendor partners, and we love our vendors too, but they steer us down this path to argue about the 10% when it doesn't really matter that much. So I said, guys, whatever you want, we'll fix it later on. Buy whatever you like. And you know, ultimately, we kind of will fix it later on as well. So you know, I think there's a couple of interesting aspects in as you think about how different we are and how the same we are, how we work our way through that, and then what we expect people to solve for us. Because our systems are all different, and we all have slightly different packaging. And so now you get to my other favorite topic, which is everybody wants to package OpenStack. Every call I get is I want you to, I, here's my, pa my packaging for OpenStack. And it doesn't matter if it's an open source organization or a commercial one too. And I go, yeah, we went down that path. You know, it's a whole lot of hard work. We didn't get what we want. It's easy to spin it ourselves, right? And so I think as you enter this world with us, and as we want to make this world better, you got to think differently about how you sell this stuff, because you know, we, we don't want to keep paying for packaging. 
I think the keys. The, the Maybe key I went off into a vendor thing here the future, and, a, the future, and a procurement <laughs> mess. The future keys are customer service. I mean, it's about support and it's about execution. Yeah. So that that what makes the, the biggest difference to me in the first place, anyway. Yeah. I want to pick up on your thing about packaging. So yeah. a funny story. Vendors tell us, oh, we tested this in Kilo, but you need to recertify it in Newton and Metaka. Well, what's the difference? Right. It's all the same. Right. The difference. And whose problem is that really? Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a mindset. We need to be able to figure out how to run VNFs on the cloud. I mean, the versions change, but that's just a management plane. It's not the, the play domain where the applications run. Yeah, and coming back to containers, I mean, I'm not really sure, right? I mean, you're quite right about networking associates. Networking is hard to do. So, you know, we, you know, one of the requirements is we run, you know, very high-speed VNFs. And so, in a, in a standard build off the shelf, it's hard to get high-speed VNFs to run. And so, we've done a lot of work to make it run that way. And, um, and so, as we, as we march towards containers and we talk about all the benefits of making these things smaller, you know, we have to go back and go, okay, how do we make this run fast? And so. So being that I'm an engineering manager, I don't have a, long, a big opinion of architecture because I'm not an architect, right? I'm a guy who's trying to get us to build stuff. But we do have some interesting stuff going on. We have some work going on with the university who's trying to figure out how to get put control plane in containers. And, and I think some of the onus guys are trying to do this stuff too, right? Which is get control plane for routing in a container, but get the forwarding down under open flow control. And it's immensely difficult. I mean, it's easy to get the one to work where you use AVS. It's really hard to get the one to work where you use Broadcom chips. So, you know, it's, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Very good. All right, guys, we have three minutes left. Um, wow. Yeah? You didn't cry either. No, I, I'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> um, you know I will. Um, <laughs> it is, absolutely. So, take a few seconds. Final message, 30 seconds, a minute, just where do we need to go? What do you see this week? Highlight from the week, message to take forwards. Start with you, Greg. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, we're grateful for this community. We got to start with a lot of lines of code. We didn't start from scratch. Not only that, we get advice from each other. So it's, that's why this thing is moving as fast as it is, is because we're able to work together. Uh, and we're committed to being open and doing that. Uh, again, I think it's in the execution and the customer service. So when we come back to OpenStack, um, there are things to improve for large operators. And, and, and uh, you hit on one of them with the networking piece. Uh, there was another one with, oh, you just talked about container, containerizing the control plane, and that's relative to the OpenStack Helm project, and I want to get you to look at that, too. Um, but uh, I think those are a couple of the major areas that OpenStack really needs to focus on and really needs to harden uh, for, for it to be viable long term and keep the threats away. Thank you. So I would say, um, you know, the operators, at least us, we, bet, we made the bet to go to the cloud. You know, OpenStack and whatever comes next, but it is a cloud. So my call to action would be, you need to build your network functions to run natively on the cloud. Mm -hmm. Embrace services-based architecture. Do we still need diameter? And I'm not picking on that, but do we need our telco silos? What do we embrace? What the web scale world has, you know, pick up on embrace services based architectures, web services based interfaces, and, you know, build the applications that run natively on the cloud. I think that'll make everybody happy. So, where we spend a lot of our time thinking, right, is simplicity of constraints in the design and the ability to do placement, right? And so, and so if you think about OpenStack's placement mechanism, it's pretty rudimentary, right? And the complexity that we're getting lower down in the stack here, because remember, we're not just placing VMs, we've got to connect them to networks the right way. We get increasing amounts of complexity in the networking component above. So as you think about, I'm asking the people who, do, who are building stuff here, as you think about what you go off and do from a networking perspective, think about, think about the simplicity, pro the problem in, in networking and the level of complexity it creates in placement. And, and that's an important thing to do. Also, we're you know, thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for having us. 
And I also want to let you know that we do most of our OpenStack development here in New England. And I have 30 recs open, and I can put someone over there you can pick up <laughs> and take your resume as you walk through. We're great guys, you'd love us. All right. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks. Yeah. Good job, man.